Hello and welcome to my personal coronavirus lockdown chamber. Uh, my family and I are healthy and fine and we wish the same for you. Stay safe out there. As we're following the current recommendations about social distancing and whatnot, avoiding groups of a certain number of people, we can't really film videos the way you might be used to, which is why I'm talking to you through a webcam in my kitchen. But because we still want to maintain some of the office environment that we enjoy at Edmunds, uh, I'm going to make some broad proclamations about the best sports cars currently on sale. This is uh, a top 10 list. Uh, and all, as always, as with all top 10 lists, the logic to make this list is totally perfect and there's no way you can make a counter argument to any of it. I stand by it. Now, the rules. What makes a sports car? It's a little tricky, but I've narrowed it down to essentially two things. One, they should prioritize driving fun. Two, they should have two doors. And that's it. If there is a vehicle on this list that we didn't mention, that I didn't mention, make sure you put it in the comments. Let's get down to it. Starting out, number 10, the BMW M4. Things have changed quite a bit since this generation of the M3 and M4 have come out. And we're talking about the M4 specifically, again, because it has two doors and that's one of the requirements to being a sports car. Uh, this thing rips and it's really cool in the context of BMW. Once you like start lining it up to other sports cars that cost the same amount of money, you start noticing, well, like, hey, this thing's really high strung in terms of ride quality, in terms of, uh, you know, how the power gets delivered to the rear wheels. And it's not that much faster. It's still thrilling to drive. And the optional competition package adds a lot of great things, including a pretty significant power increase and also some of the coolest looking wheels you can get on any new car. I mean, they're even called like style 666M or something like that. But the ride is pretty poor with that competition spec and poor to the point where you start wondering if the performance benefits are worth it. Now the turbo six cylinder is really powerful, doesn't sound particularly impressive, although it is loud, especially with that competition pack. What I really adore about this thing is the engine. Not basically how it sounds, but the power delivery, the power band. And I like the fact that you can get it with a manual transmission. As it's becoming rarer and rarer, it's nice that it's available. I remember driving this car way back at the launch at Road America and thinking, man, this chassis is amazing. This thing handles in a really fun way, but I kind of wish it had the naturally aspirated V8, i.e. non-turbocharged V8 from the previous generation M3. But that's what kind of limits the M4 from being higher on this list. Still a really fun car. There's no losers on this list, but I think given the context of today's sports cars, the M4 has some shortcomings as, as other vehicles have gotten much better and much better, and some of them do it for less money. I mean, this thing still starts at like $70,000, and that's quite a bit of money when you start looking at what else you can get in that price range. Speaking of, number nine, uh, the Mercedes-Benz AMG C63 Coupe and Coupe S, which is the more expensive and more powerful version. Look, this is basically like, broadly speaking, very close to an M4. It's a coupe that's based on a German luxury sedan and it's gone power lifting for a while and throwing kettlebells around at the gym. It's more aggressive in terms of handling relative to the car it's based on, and it's really enjoyable to drive. And okay, versus the M4, it doesn't handle as sharp. The C63 is gonna be slower around a racetrack than the M4, but how often are you taking 4,200 pound German luxury coupes to a racetrack? What I've found in my experience is that the areas where the M4 shines in terms of handling balance sacrifice its on-road refinement and comfort, and the C63 kind of goes in opposite direction. Yes, we're talking about sports cars, but I'm also mean you lose some of the driving pleasures that you need to have when you're just tooling around town or even up in the mountain roads, where the M4, especially the competition spec one, can be a little too firm. The C63 is that perfect level of comfort and sportiness where it's really nice to enjoy. You don't really care about the performance numbers too much, even though, yeah, you can get 503 horsepower out of it. And that makes it really satisfying to drive. Yeah, the M4 is 
superior in terms of driving dynamics in a place that you, you're not going to really use the C63. So the comparison doesn't really even add up. The C63 also has the V8, and that's really what it comes down to uh, for my taste uh, in particular. When you fire up a C63, it makes that really loud exhaust sound, that crackle, and when you lay onto it when you're rolling on a freeway on-ramp, it's very, very satisfying in the way the M4 is it. I should note though, relative to both of these cars, the Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio is a better driving car than both of them, but because it's a four-door sedan, it's not a sports car and therefore not on this list. Moving on. Number eight, you could say is a tie, but it's the Toyota 86 and Subaru BRZ. They're identical. They're the same car, just with different badges on it and slightly different options and availability and trim packages too. I think Subaru has a special handling package available for the BRZ that you can't get on the Toyota. Forget the details for a second. Broadly speaking, if, if I owned a driving school, this would be the fleet of cars. Uh, these are, you know, at a fundamental level, the best representation of why rear wheel drive is so much fun in a sports car and they give it to you for not a lot of money. The engineers behind these cars have very carefully considered the balance of these vehicles, how they should behave when you turn the wheel, how this traction should break away, and how everything should work. The fundamental you know, attributes of these cars mean everybody can enjoy driving them quickly, and that's very important. The downside is that they're slow. They're really slow, especially when you're driving around town. I spent a year driving a Subaru BRZ in LA and as much fun as I had on the curvy roads, I can tell you it was really annoying to get blasted by, you know, compact SUVs and EVs all the time because it isn't just the zero to 60 acceleration. It's the time it takes to actually, you know, a light screen clutch in first gear, you know, engage the, engage the clutch, roll on the gas, and the power band just isn't quite suited for that rapid acceleration. So you really gotta be working these things hard in order to get a lot of fun out of them. That said, inexpensive way to get some of the best that rear wheel drive handling has to offer you in a platform, and you can get a manual. Again, good to highlight. And I should point out too that the automatic in the BRZ at 86, I'm told, I don't think I've ever actually driven one, but I'm told isn't that bad. So there's that, but get a manual, learn how to drive manual. Seventh place goes to the Chevy Camaro. Uh, and this was a difficult one because I really, really, really like the Camaro, especially the 1LE performance variants. And that's what we're gonna talk about specifically amongst Camaro performance cars, sports cars, because those are the ones that are really, um, really do the trick for me. The Camaro 1LE variants are the dynamic champions of uh, the muscle cars, without a doubt. Uh, you could make a case, and I think I am in this list by calling them uh, sports cars, from the uh, turbo two liter to the V6 to the V8 and the supercharged V8. The 1LE package makes these cars a lot of fun. And there's some really neat tech underneath the Camaro, depending on how you configure it. Bro broadly speaking, uh, you have access to Chevy's really amazing traction control software, they call it Performance Traction Management, and it's a very cool driving tool that teaches you how to drive cars faster while also keeping you safe. Uh, and you combine that with some of the other things like the Performance Data Recorder, which is basically an onboard data logger and video system where you can actually record you driving fast on a racetrack, of course. You can analyze the data the car has spit out and then see where you can improve and how you can make yourself go better. It's really neat stuff. Outside of that, you have electronically controlled lock and rear differential, you have uh, the Magna Ride. You have a lot of these really sophisticated vehicle controls that enable this car to have kind of a really nice balance when it comes down to it. I mean, that's really the trick. You're driving this car really fast, you don't really notice this stuff at work. And that's important because you shouldn't be aware of the electronics, you know, helping you out. And it's just fun. Uh, it's fast and it's fun. And we gotta talk transmissions uh, because you have a range of transmission offerings from a variety of manuals, even like a 10-speed automatic. But I only gotta call it the manual because the performance manual Camaros, you can flat shift. Flat shifting, if you're not familiar, is what happens when you want to maximize acceleration by keeping uh, keep the gas pedal pinned, clutch in, shift a second, release the clutch, foot's flat on the gas the whole time. This makes for faster acceleration, but is incredibly abusive to the transmission and the drive line. So you don't really do it unless you desperately need to like save the world for some reason. 
But Chevy's built this tech into their manual transmissions and they run electronic trickery to make sure that you don't actually hurt anything when you do that in their high performance uh, Camaros. And that's really fun. I remember driving the turbo two liter Camaro 1LE around town and just flat shifting it while I was, you know, driving to the grocery store because why not? It's hilarious. It's really, really fun to do. And the Camaro gives you a lot of features for your money. Uh, you get a lot of this tech and a lot of this enjoyment for roughly the same price as an equivalent Mustang, if not less. So why is it seventh? And it's because of everything else, uh, frankly. Yeah, we're talking about sports cars and it's gonna sound weird to bring up usability, functionality, cargo space, because you shouldn't have high expectations for those when it comes to sports cars, but the Camaros is so bad in this regard that you have to call it out. The interior space is tiny. The interior storage is non-existent, let's say. The layout of where you put things doesn't work. I mean, the wireless charging pad is like behind the center armrest in a place where it just like doesn't make sense. Uh, the trunk is ridiculously small and the trunk opening is, is hilarious. I mean, like it's laughable. So yeah, it's weird to criticize interior functionality and cargo space, but you still have to be able to drive a car and use it like a car and the Camaro makes that really challenging, and that's why I pushed it down this far. Wish it was higher, but it's my own logic, so I have nothing to complain about. Number six is the Porsche 718, and that uh, encompasses both the Boxster and the Cayman. Functionally the same car, one doesn't have a roof, one does. Um, I have to preface this by saying I haven't driven the six cylinder variants of the 718 generation Boxster and Cayman. I've only spent time in the four cylinder versions and that's why likely, presumably, the Boxster is sixth. If we were talking about the previous generation Boxster, this car would probably place a lot higher. And that's because as much as I like the way this car handled, you can drive this thing so quickly around a racetrack and you can get it so out of whack when you're going around corners and bring it right back in. It just makes you, makes me smile every single time I'm in it. And then you have to listen to that four cylinder. This flat four, some people like it, I don't. The sound is just so coarse to my ears that I didn't really want to rev, rev out the engine. And that's the opposite of what a sports car should do. When you start exploring that tack, you should be rewarded by the sound and it should make you want to rev higher. I've gone on about this before, and I think Porsche is very aware of why else would we see uh, new six-cylinder variants of these cars. The only other complaint I can make about the 718 uh, is just generally how tall the gearing is. Credit to the Boxer and came in for offering a manual as well. Really excited to drive the six-cylinder versions of those cars because I think that's going to really help the placement in my list, on my personal list, uh, and I think people are gonna really enjoy those cars too. Number five, the Toyota GR Supra, or Toyota Supra. Look, I, I like this thing a lot more than the 718s I've driven. Again, haven't driven a 718 with a six cylinder, but the Supra, I, I really, really liked. Yes, everybody knows it's based all on BMW hardware. I don't care. <laughs> you know why? Because the result is really, really fun to drive. Put all the heritage aside, put all the brands aside because fundamentally it's, it's just a good car. For next year, for 2021, it's gonna have an available four cylinder engine and then it's gonna have a more powerful six cylinder. I think the six cylinder is going up to like 380 horsepower. If you ask me, I don't think it needed that amount of power, but hey, you have it anyway. So to start with the engine, it has a BMW source turbocharged six cylinder. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> Every time you start exploring that power band, you remember that, hey, this is what a six cylinder sounds like. This is why you want it under the hood of your sports car, because it sounds super rad. It doesn't hurt that we also have, in the North America, we also have the louder exhaust system that the rest of the world doesn't get, so hey, go us. Much like with the 86 in the, in the Subaru BRZ, the engineers in this thing really played close attention to the handling response and dynamics and behavior of this car. So when you're really hustling this thing, you can start exploring that balance and it becomes apparent that uh, they knew what they were doing when they signed off on it. From my experience, uh, this is a very loose car. Uh, loose in the sense that it will oversteer. 
and not in a sudden or uncontrollable way. It's a way that I would describe like very engaging and very fun. It's, it's one of the few cars that I've immediately gotten into and been okay hanging out in third or fourth gear just because the car was so controllable at that level. Fun car to drive on track. And then when you get to the real roads and you're not power slaying it because you don't want to go to jail, you still have a really enjoyable uh, drivetrain. You have a really enjoyable chassis. It's, it's not uncomfortably firm, uh, pleasant steering. It's still a good car to take up a mountain road. Uh, but like many cars on this list, it is really fast at that point. But it strikes a really nice balance um, that you would want from a sports car. Now, it has problems. The wind buffeting is, is pretty poor, the roof line's really low, and then you have the existence of the Camaro and Mustang and Corvette, <laughs> right? Yeah, they're not all gonna be the same when it comes to price, but there's gonna be some tough decisions to be made if you're looking at buying a sports car at the fifty to $60,000 range. Lastly, no manual with the Supra, and that is unfortunate. Number four is gonna be the Ford Mustang. And we have to specify that we're talking again about the high performance versions of it. And that's specifically the performance package uh, for both the turbo four cylinder and the GT. I forget to call it the track package or the performance package, but it's the elevated one. Uh, GT350 and GT350R and GT500. These are monster, monster cars. I gotta point out, as, as, as a self-admitted uh, Camaro fan, that the Camaro is generally cost less and can be faster on trim level to trim level, but what really tips the scales in the Mustang's favor is the GT350's V8. I mean, let's be honest, it's an 8,000 plus RPM, 5.2 liter V8, that sounds like all hell's breaking loose when you, when you, rev, it, when you rev the thing out. just shift by feel and not by looking at the tack, you would always short shift about 4,000 RPM too early. When you're really standing on the gas pedal and focusing on that tack, your jaw just continues to drop as the engine keeps spinning and spinning and spinning. It's wild, it's raucous, it's, it sounds fantastic. And it, and it gets you thinking about all the uh, high school driving impulses that you've quickly learned to not think about because again, you don't want to go to jail, but it, it encourages that kind of driving behavior. Love the fact that you get it with a manual. Love the fact that you can get it with carbon fiber wheels, uh, so the GT350R specifically. And this thing is just a lot of fun. Highlights over the Camaro, visibility, cargo space, all that stuff. But that engine in the GT350 and the GT350R is truly something special. Number three in our list is the Mazda MX-5 Miata. And this is what sports cars used to be before we all, me included, started bench racing and using performance figures uh, to determine, you know, objective quality of one vehicle of another, because then you have to, the horsepower race starts and then the acceleration race starts. You create some really fun cars when you're on those arms races, but the Miata is a really refreshing reminder of how simple driving fun can be. I mean, this is just a small, lightweight car that's driver focused and that's about it. You drive one of these things, you realize, oh, I don't need 600 horsepower and 1.05 G acceleration laterally to have a good time. I can have it in something that costs about 30 grand, has less than 200 horsepower, and is just focused on the act of driving. There are pro race car drivers who love driving Miatas, and that should tell you all you need to know about them. And what's great is, look, this is not an extraordinarily powerful car. It doesn't have a ton of tire grip, and that means that you don't necessarily need to be going 300 miles an hour to enjoy it. You can drive this thing, you know, close to its limit, just around town, and nobody really notices because it's a Miata, but you're having a great time. You don't need to risk your license doing so. And it's also not slow either. It doesn't feel as slow as the Toyota 86 and the um, Subaru BRZ. Uh, because the engine's more lively, it's more zippy, it's more exciting, it has a, a more interesting character, especially around the red line, and the manual's a lot of fun to drive, too. Look, often when I tell somebody about a really powerful car I've just driven, they have to ask, where can you actually use that power? When I'm talking about the Miata, the answer is everywhere. You can drive this thing everywhere, uh, mountain roads, to and from work, on racetracks, and it's all gonna be fun, and that's why this car is so special. 
it does have the sports car compromises of not having a lot of cargo space and basically no interior space, but they're more acceptable because this is a smaller car with that sports car mission put out very clearly, and that's why it's number three. Number two on this list I'm, I'm giving to two vehicles, and hey, it's my list so I get to break my own rules. Uh, so, so what? <laughs> Number two is, is both the Mercedes-Benz AMG GT and the Porsche 911. Um, they're, they're funny because they're both German cars who go about making sports cars uh, in two very different ways, but also very effective ways. AMG GT, front engine, V8, rear drive, very brutish, very big, very loud. 911, rear engine, six cylinder, very calculated, very controlled, and you really can't go wrong with either. Often when people ask me, what 911 should I buy? I tell them whichever one you can afford. And the same goes for Mercedes. Uh, much like you know, sports cars at $50,000, if you're looking between an AMG GT and a 911, I don't envy your decision process because, hey, either way you're gonna end up with something good, but man, Deciding between the two is gonna be tough. Um, I've spent a lot of time in both of these cars and there's a lot of things I like about both. AMG GT, uh, I love the character. I love the V8. I love, much like the C63, just how loud this thing is when you roll on the gas pedal on a freeway on ramp. This thing just rips. So a little bit of tire slip there is to be expected. I love the fact that in the AMG GTR, you get a little traction control knob on the center of the dash that's reminiscent of uh, DTM cars. It's a really nice homage. Uh, with the 911, I mean, you, you have uh, an incredible history and you have, as part of that history, a lot of engineers providing a particular driving style, a particular driving experience. Uh, and, and that's the result of that is a car that can be enjoyed again by everyone and almost enjoyed immediately. 911s are interesting because the modern ones really don't have that much of a learning curve. You've heard of horror stories in the past, 911s would lift off oversteer. Lift off oversteer is the act of when you turn into a corner and release the gas pedal, the, the rear tires would break loose. Uh, and that happens just because physics of where the majority of the mass in that vehicle is located. But modern 911s have gone through a lot of evolutions, both in how they're laid out, you know, at a, at a physical level, but and also their electronic controls to minimize that behavior. And when you know what you're doing with one, you can access that attribute as a handling tool. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can largely just ignore it too and, and just drive it and have fun. There's, there's a lot of tech in there to make sure it works the right way. The 911 is also really cool too because it delivers really strong sports car performance but with power figures that are generally lower than the rest of the field. I mean, yeah, I know the new turbo has, what, 640 horsepower or something? Standard cars have less than 400, and that's pretty admirable to have a $100,000 sports car that has less than 400 horsepower, and yet it all works. These are still very rapid cars. Uh, there's a ton of variety within the 911 range and all, to a lesser extent the AMG GT range. So there's a style of 911 for every person. You can make it really work for you. Uh, and I've, I've drove the last generation GT2 RS. I've been in the new generation uh, Carrera and Carrera S. And there's minor differences if you know what you're looking at if you're a Porsche file, but generally the driving experience is what really shines through and it's something that everybody can appreciate and love. Number one is the Chevrolet Corvette, the C8 in particular, the newest generation of Corvette. I mean, could it be anything else? This is a American mid-engine sports car with a naturally aspirated V8, a non-turbocharged V8. It's one of the few remaining vehicles of this type. I mean, I don't know where else you can get a naturally aspirated V8 in your mid-engine sports car. And yes, yes, let's, let's acknowledge the fact that you can't get it with a manual, but when I drove the C8, I found the automatic more than adequate to take on the task, and I was so enthusiastic about that driving experience, how the immediacy of the steering, how quick those, those shifts came in. It's a whole new world when it comes to the driving experience. It feels, uh, just the orientation of the cabin feels exotic, and yet you've got a base price of $60,000. 
And when you option the car up, you get really cool technology like the Camaro. You get that active locking differential. You get the performance traction management. You get the performance data recorder. You get the Magna Ride. Yeah, they're optional, but you can get them all. But you also have like a front axle lift with GPS memory. So that's a lot of features there that uh, come at a really stellar price. And value is really the Corvette's um, attribute here. It's the biggest attribute. The, the Porsche 911, the modern 911, is dynamically superior. It's more fun, but like slightly so. The Corvette's price is is really the ticket. And it's not the base $60,000 model, but like the reasonable one, the one that you'd spec out, the sensibly equipped one, and the one that I've spec'd out is about $75,000. If I were to sensibly equip a 911 Carrera S, just the way I'd kind of like it, I'm north of 130 real quickly. And so that's what gives the oh. Corvette its advantage uh, to my eyes and on this list. It, I mean, it really is like a blue collar sports car uh, uh, because there isn't much else out there that can deliver this kind of package. This thing is, is fun. It looks radical on the street, whether you like the styling or not. It really uh, stands out and says something different. Um, it's affordable, and let's be honest, there's some patriotism here, I'll fully admit that, but this is like attainable dream car stuff, and that's what makes it really exciting. I'm really looking forward to, to driving this more, and I can't wait till uh, or we get our long-term car in the fleet, though. Who knows when that's going to happen at this point. That's going to wrap up this list of the best sports cars currently available. If I've left a vehicle out, again, let me know in the comments, and I'm sure you're gonna disagree with a couple of these placements. Um, you can comment all you want, I'll probably reply. If not, set such is the world. I'll tell you what, if you really disagree with uh, this list, get a camera, hop on YouTube, make your own list. Let me know, because <laughs> I'm eager to see it. If you liked this one, if you wanna see more videos like this, we might be cooped up like this for a while, and we can talk for a long time about our favorite cars and experiences. Thanks for watching, hit like and subscribe, and make sure to visit edmunds.com to find your perfect car.